Now, we're going to turn our attention now to The Thief, His Wife and The Canoe, which is a programme that starts tonight on ITV. It's a dramatisation of the story of John Darwin. All I ever wanted was a simple life. I'm going to fake my death. What could be simpler? I begged him to turn himself in. Where have you decided to live when it's all calmed down? Next bloody door! Genius! Hopes are fading in the search for John Darwin. We should never give up hope, should we, Mum? He'll be absolutely fine. Full English, please. It was all going to his plan. Gotcha! You want me to exploit people's genuine sympathy for your benefit? Well, obviously, don't put it like that. Then. Yes. What could possibly go wrong? Yes, it's a drama, a drama that starts on ITV at 9pm tonight. It's based on a book of the same name, which has just been published. Its co-author is retired Detective Superintendent Tony Hutchinson, who oversaw the UK investigation into John Darwin's disappearance, and he joins us now. Good morning, Tony. Morning. Good morning. Well, this must be very exciting for you to be involved in an ITV drama and a book, of course. Yes, it's the story that uh, doesn't go away. Here we are, <laughs> but 20 years after John Darwin paddled his canoe into the North Sea, and we're still talking about it now. Oh, we are. Uh, we are course, indeed. There is a four-part drama on starting this <laughs> evening, yes. Well, well, for those who have no idea about this story, maybe didn't hear it, or they, they heard it at the time and, and kind of forgot about it and, and might need a reminder, what was this story about? What did John Darwin do? John Darwin at that time was a prison officer. Uh, they've got themselves into an enormous amount of debt. Uh, so he struck upon the plan that he would paddle into uh, into the North Sea in his canoe uh, and he'd be reported missing. His wife, he didn't turn up for work. His wife re and reported him missing. Uh, there was a huge uh, a rescue operation, whereas in effect all he did was paddle to the next bay. His wife picked him up, put him on a train, and he went to the west side of the country uh, and he was in a bed and breakfast watching the air sea rescue while people were in the dark risking the necks. Uh, he then subsequently after that, he stayed in hiding for about six weeks uh, and then he returned home. Uh, they lived in a big seafront villa, uh, but they also owned the one next door, which was bed sits. So if anybody came knocking at the door, John Darwin would run up the stairs, pull back a wardrobe, there was a hole in the wall, and he'd step into the bedsit, which was basically, he was stepping into his own private Narnia. <laughs> and he'd just hide there. And and they, and they claimed the, the life insurance on him, didn't they? Well, of course, there was sort of death and service benefits, there was life insurances, there was accidents insurance, mortgage protection insurances. So you're talking in excess of £600,000. Wow. And then I, one of the biggest parts of the story is is how he was found to have been hiding in this house and also, you know, fraudulently claiming life insurance. Yes, well, of course, what happened, the plan was that they were going to start a new life in Panama. They want to have an eco resort where they're actually going to be teaching people canoeing, uh, believe it or not. Um, but, of course, there was going to be issues with his visa, so he needed to become John Darwin again. He was travelling on a false passport. Uh, so he came back to the UK, walked into a police station in London uh, in early December and just exclaimed, I think I'm a missing person and why are all the Christmas lights up when it's only June? <laughs> uh, and that was the start of his amnesia. Uh, and I'm convinced that he just thought, well, I'll just come play the amnesia card. Everybody always say, oh, that's fantastic. Off your pop, John. It didn't quite work out like that for No, him. no, it didn't indeed. I mean, I almost feel stupid asking this question, but what do you think it is about this case that people are fascinated by? I, I guess one of the, the main things is that it's totally bonkers. It's totally bonkers. I'm old enough to remember the 1970s sitcom Reggie Perrin, where Leonard Rossiter faked his own death. He left his clothes on the seashore and Darwin didn't really do much different. Uh, but of course, whilst there's a lot of comedic aspects to it, you know, there's some serious aspects as well. Not the least of sort of lying to the family. Yeah, well, of oh, course, yeah, oh. and especially his sons. If I'm if I'm not wrong, you you're not wrong. You're totally correct, and I'm not sure how many people would understand telling two children that the father had died and carrying on with that masquerade for five and a half years. Yeah, people have made their own judgment on that. Yeah, well, yeah, indeed. 
How has how has this case then impacted on your life? Because being a police officer, being a detective superintendent, you you cover hundreds of cases. But I guess this one is going to leave a lifelong impression on you. Well, as I've, as I've said, here we are 20 years after you, after you disappeared and I'm talking to you this morning on an Easter Sunday about it. So <laughs> this is the case that uh, doesn't go away and it's it just fascinates people. And I suspect now it will fascinate a new generation of people when it starts tonight because my eldest son's 25 and he was he can't really remember much about the case. So he'll find it all fascinating, as I'm sure lots of people will. Mm. And just the sheer audacity of what they tried to do and how indeed he, he just hid in the bedsit next door. Yeah, you, as I was saying in the introduction there, you oversaw the UK investigation into John Darwin's disappearance. Of course, not everything was in the UK because he travelled to Panama and ultimately was was found out because there was a picture picture of him taken in a in a state agent's, I think, if I'm not uh, if I'm not wrong. Tell us a little bit about that and and how on earth you put this all together to realise what John Darwin had done. To be fair, once he uh, returned to the UK, our sort of my decision, our, our what we were going to do was just to leave him with his sons and investigate it in slow time. But of course, we got an, an anonymous tip off from a lady who rang to say she discovered this photograph on the internet, and of course, the photograph showed that Darwin, Mr. Darwin, his wife Anne, uh, both of them there in smiling. And of course, what you got to remember is we're going back to that photograph was taken in 2006. We didn't live our lives on the internet like we do now. Mm. You know, WhatsApp didn't exist. Instagram didn't exist. The iPhone was a month old. Uh, so they probably wouldn't expect to for that to have been on the World Wide Web. And the police and, and indeed the posse of journalists who were trying to find Anne Darwin, they never, you know, wasn't an investigative strand in those days, whereas now everybody would check the internet back in December 2007. They didn't. Um, but of course, that that blew the that blew the whole story out of the window. And we then subsequently moved quickly to arrest John Darwin before the uh, photograph was in the newspaper. And of course, it was the next day, and the headline in the particular newspaper was "Canoes This in Panama." And and they both ended up spending time in prison for for what they did. Do you know what they are doing now? Are they are they out and and leading completely normal lives after this completely unbelievable, you know, moment in time? They are uh, they are uh, released from prison. Uh, the pair of them, I understand, Anne's just living quietly uh, and is reconciled with her, her two sons, uh, John, uh, narcissistic John. Well, he's now in the uh, Philippines, he's in Manila. He's been photographed by various media outlets and he's married to a, a Filipino lady who's considerably his junior. Uh, so he's he's married to Mercy May and living in Manila. Wow. I mean, it's so unbelievable, this story, that it's almost, if you put it into a book, you would <laughs> yeah. read it and think, well, this is completely made up. But, I mean, it's obviously not the case. How did you get involved with writing the book about this story then? David David Lee, who was the the journalist who tracked down Anne in Panama, he had a, um, an awful lot of material. He'd uh, put a lot of this together, and that was what was the basis of the drama. And then David just asked me if I'd like to get involved, uh, and I was pleased to do so, and I've thoroughly enjoyed flashing emails across the Atlantic because David's out in Miami uh, with all our sort of alterations. Tony, can I, uh, yes, can I just ask, people. what was it like? You've, you've, you know, you've seen a lot of different cases in your career. What did you feel like when you real, when the, when the extent of what had happened here, sort of when it dawned on you what had gone on, what did you feel like in that moment? The moment that sticks out in my mind the most is when I got a phone call of uh, one of the uh, people working on the investigation uh, to tell me to look at that, to, to go on the website and look at the photograph. And I remember I just burst out laughing. And I thought, <laughs> well, that's, that has blown your amnesia out of the water. Uh, yeah. And then it was just a case of moving fast to get them. So that was that's one of my biggest memories. Um, but as, as I look back, I still find it difficult to understand how they did what they did to the sons and their extended family. And, of course, 
there's the issue with regards to the air sea rescue somebody might have been five ten miles further down the coast that night actually needing to be rescued yeah and something could have gone tragically wrong there and of course we all pay for insurance fraud uh on your premiums and everything but you're right uh, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Mm, I think that's definitely the case here. Definitely the case, Tony. I wonder, because this is obviously a four-parter on ITV starting tonight at nine, I wonder if that's going to bring a new generation of, of people learning about this story and understanding, you know, this unbelievable story of John Darwin. I think that's definitely the case. As I've already said, my 25-year-old son, he can't remember very much about it and my 15 year old son can't remember anything yeah. about it so there will be a generation like that across the the uk and there will there'll be people who will be reminded of it and of course what it, what the drama will show is the extent that uh, david lee and indeed the other uh tabloid journalists the extent they'll go to to uh, track somebody down and, and i found that fascinating uh, reading that part of david lee's account and I'm sure everybody else will find it fascinating. Now you've not seen you've not seen any of the the programmes yet. So how are you going to be watching it tonight then? Uh, I'll just sit down and start to watch it with my uh, with my family. Uh, but normally I tend to walk out if there's anything that involves me. <laughs> it's a long time since anything has involved me, but I tend to walk out and watch it in a darkened room by myself at a later date. Oh, well, I'm sure everyone is going to really enjoy watching it. It's such, such an incredible story. Thank you very much. The, the retired detective superintendent, Tony Hutchinson, who oversaw the UK investigation into John Darwin's disappearance, because, of course, that is the subject of the ITV dramatisation that's on tonight. The Thief, His Wife and the Canoe that's on an ITV at 9pm tonight. Thank you very much, Tony, for joining us on Five Live Breakfast.